Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, my name is Jan Prins. Uh, I run Navigant's Energy Practice um, uh, globally. We work with our clients um, day to day, uh, looking at their most um, uh, challenging uh, issues and, and opportunities uh, in the space of, of energy. And um, uh, before I, I make my opening comments, I'm delighted to be here. This is my first uh, summit. Um, and I, I do think I come from a little bit of a different world and maybe bring some uh, interesting perspectives, but I think things are really changing and I think there is uh, a path forward, which is really, really exciting. Um, I want to introduce the, uh, the panelists today and I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves briefly from, from left to right. Um, Kateri Callahan from uh, President and from Alliance to Safe Energy. Um, you want to Sure. Okay. Quickly. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. I'm Kateri Callahan, and I'm with the Alliance to Save Energy, which is an NGO based in Washington, D.C. We've been around for 38 years, and our sole mission is to advance energy efficiency. Uh, we work with the Congress. We actually have 14 sitting members of the U.S. Congress as honorary members of our board of directors, and about 140 different businesses and organizations lend their support and help us to advance our cause. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C., but we do try to act globally and try to influence policy and actions by businesses and governments all around the world, not just in the U.S. Thank you. And, and Kateri has been working and, and is currently working on some very interesting initiatives, and she will talk a little bit about that in a minute. Uh, next to Kateri, Dan Hamza Goodacre. He's the Director of Energy Efficiency uh, with Climate Works Foundation. Dan, can you... If Thanks, Jan. Yep. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here as well. I am the Director of Efficiency at the Climate Works Foundation, which is based in San Francisco, but we also have a global remit <coughs> focusing mostly on China, the US, Europe, India, and Brazil. Uh, climate Works mission is to mobilize philanthropy to solve the climate crisis and ensure a prosperous future. So energy productivity is a key part of what we do. Thank you, Dan. Um, to the left of Dan, uh, Mark Watts, uh, Executive Director of C40 Cities Climate Leadership Group. Hi, uh, C40 is an organization of the world's megacities focused on tackling climate change. And essentially, we bring together the big cities of the world, the New Yorks, the London, Paris, Tokyo, Beijing, etc. Despite the name, we have 80 uh, members now. <laughs> And it's uh, essentially a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. It's helping mayors and senior officials help each other to be more ambitious in tackling climate change. Thank you, uh, Mark. And um, last but not least, Thijs Aarten, CEO and MD of uh, Ecofis. Thijs, a little bit of an introduction. Good morning, uh, everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, Ecofis is, uh, is a leading consultancy focusing on renewable energy, uh, energy, carbon efficiency, energy systems and markets. Uh, and energy uh, strategies and policies. And we're based uh, in, in Northwest Europe, but very much in outreach uh, global. It's good to be here. Uh, on a personal note, uh, 35 years in the industry, um, but I have a strong passion for uh, the subject we, are, uh, we have here, and uh, I'd like to share that with, uh, with you in a minute. Thank you. Good so to be here. Before each of the, the panelists will, uh, will introduce um, their perspective on, on the topic today, um, I, I do think uh, things are changing, um, and, and I work, we work a lot with um, some of the big players in the energy space, um, some of the very large utilities, uh, but also government organizations, uh, regulators, um, and, and others. Um, we as an organization uh, are going through a change as well, and, and, and if I tell that story, I think it's a reflection of what's happening in the industry from, from, from my perspective. I joined Navigant last year, early last year, and we have people, actually half of my team works in the energy efficiency, demand side management, demand response space. Uh, we design energy efficiency programs, we uh, run them, implement them, and we measure the outcomes of energy efficiency programs, and we have a lot of those people. And those are people that are very passionate about climate change and, and you know, the impact that we can have as an organization in, in creating uh, a more sustainable uh, world. And then I also have people that help you know, um, uh, uh, the, the organizations on the supply side, uh, generation, transmission, and distribution. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, around renewables, wind, solar. Uh, we do a lot of work uh, uh, in terms of how can we reduce the, the losses and, and the waste uh, on the, uh, from the supply side. Um, and we have gone through a transformation ourselves within the practice. 
Uh, and we started to look at the impacts that we can have if we, as, an, as a you know, relatively small team, 500 people, uh, 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 look at this more holistically, uh, looking at the entire supply chain from demand all the way through you know, supply and generation and work every single piece of that supply chain and make it uh, more efficient um, and, and tie it to productivity. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there has been, you know, uh, uh, so far, um, up to very recently, uh, a lot of work done uh, in terms of energy efficiency and productivity on both sides. We see it coming together strongly. We see large utilities right now taking their energy efficiency demand response programs that were kind of separate somewhere under regulatory or under customer service, we see them integrating those capabilities mm -hmm. into their grid operations. Yeah. And that's a huge change. Uh, we see uh, utility CEOs now where two years ago they said, Jan, listen, we understand there are renewables and we understand there's energy efficiency and demand response, but it won't change my strategy, it won't change my business model, it won't change the way we make money. We see them now uh, giving uh, teams uh, direction in terms of we need to figure out how we can make money around renewables and how we can drive more energy efficiency and demand response and how, how can we make uh, a business out of that. So, so what I clearly see are the objectives from both sides are, are becoming much better aligned and I think that will put us actually in a position where we can really make step changes. I think if we continue to look at, at you know, energy productivity uh, only from a demand side or only from a, from a supply side, the solutions will be suboptimal. Um, there's, there's four big trends as well, and then I will hand it over to Kateri. There's four big trends that are happening right now. Uh, serious regulation now being put in place, um, not only in North America, Europe, but I think across, across, the, across the globe. I, I travel a lot in the Middle East. They're serious about that as well. Um, we see um, a uh, more decentralized grid with higher penetration of renewables and distribution of resources. That will be a game changer. Uh, we see technology advancing uh, really fast. And then last but not least, and I think that it will be a big driver of change and, and not necessary you know, regulation, uh, um, um, is customer choice. Uh, uh, customers, broadly defined, whether it's me uh, as an individual customer, whether it's large uh, customers, uh, uh, residential, or sorry, um, commercial and industrial, whether it's cities, they're gonna make their own choices in terms of how they wanna uh, uh, buy power, or produce power themselves and what type of power they want to buy or produce themselves. So customer choice and technology will be the driving elements uh, and regulation and business models and companies trying to make money uh, and, and they will, will follow what's happening right now. So, and with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Kateri to make uh, her opening comments. Thank you, and I'm gonna ask you to tap me on the shoulder sure. if I start yes. running too long. I, this is my favorite topic to discuss, so I can get very carried away about it. Um, Tony mentioned when we started that the term energy productivity is one that's been in the lexicon since 1865, but if you go back to the Alliance's journey on the road to establishing a goal around energy productivity, go back to 2012, and we did a search of the modern press, the literature, trying to figure out uh, if people were talking about energy productivity and there was literally nothing um, that was being really written about it um, or talked about back in 2011, 2012 when we started on our journey. And the way we got started on that journey as an organization that advances energy efficiency was to look at the way that the world was changing. And I'm going to take it from the basis of the U.S. and then try to build that out to suggest that the same kinds of things and trends were happening uh, in other parts around the world. We were coming off of a recession in 2012, but much too slowly, and a, a hyper-focus on the economy and ways to build that and strengthen it. Um, in the U.S., and I think in other parts of the world, we also were witnessing a sweep across all levels of government towards a more conservative-leaning government and more a focus on business. Uh, in the U.S., we were enjoying the beginning of an age of energy abundance, all that contributed, I think, very much to a downplaying on the environmental side in terms of, of the discussion, the broad discussion among policymakers and others. Uh, and we feared, at least at the Alliance to Save Energy, that that could also translate into less of a focus on energy efficiency than we had been enjoying for the past 10 years when a lot of really strong policies were being put in place. So we wanted to look at a, the next generation of energy efficiency policy, and to do that, we wanted to put it in a frame so that we wouldn't look small and only try to make incremental and changes around the edge. 
Uh, we put a commission together of Republicans, Democrats, businesses across all sectors of the economy and the environmentalists and said, okay, what should be our goal? And we as staff put forward, well, we think we should reduce energy use by 25% because McKinsey tells us that we can do that cost effectively, meaning with technologies that are available off the shelf today that can be put in place uh, cost effectively, return more to the economy than they consume. A Republican, George Pataki, who's now a, a candidate for president, although he's seen as the ghost in, in the U.S., you don't hear a lot about his name, said, I'm not going to do that. It's easy to reduce energy consumption. We can do what we did in 08, kick the economy in the teeth, and energy production will go down. Uh, we need something else. So we began to look at it, and lo and behold, EIA, the Energy Information Administration, does track energy productivity and has for decades in the United States. And we found that between 1980 and 2010, energy productivity, meaning getting twice as much GDP, or getting GDP from each unit of energy, had doubled. We were getting twice as much GDP in the United States from each unit of energy we consumed as we did back in 1980. And we decided, well, can we do that again? So what are the proof points there? EIA does projections going forward. And they said, just as a business as usual case, we can double energy, or we can improve energy productivity in the United States 57% by 2030, just business as usual, doing nothing else. So we said, well, why can't we do roughly twice that? We've got innovation coming faster. We have motivated businesses. We want to push at global competition and improving the economy. Let's see if we can double that. And we had modeling done by the um, uh, National Renewable Energy Lab looking at policies that were in place across the United States and saying, if we spread those good ones around, could we in fact do that? And what they found was we not only could double energy productivity, but we could do even better. So I'm now going to be starting to run out of time. So I'm, I'm going to go on to that to say that this notion of doing more with less and doubling energy productivity was something that captured the attention of the U.S. government. And in February of 2013, a week after we put out our report on why you should do it, how you should do it, uh, and here's the strategy and the 54 policy recommendations, President Obama adopted the goal of doubling energy productivity or cutting our energy use in half by the year 2030. And that set folks, I think, around the world looking at how else to do that. Australia has its own 2x EP, two times energy productivity uh, goal. The Australian government, very conservative, put in place a goal to reduce energy consumption by 40% by 2030, but on a 2015 baseline. Europe has embarked, and Eric made mention of a, a, the study that I'm sure ECOFIS, who uh, was commissioned to do the study, will talk about, but looking at an energy productivity economic prosperity index for 130 countries around the world and looking at what the benefit could be. And Eric actually cited uh, the six million jobs created, $23 trillion to the global economy if we achieve this. What's it gonna take? It's gonna take businesses, environmentalists, and us working together uh, with policymakers to put in place the right policy framework that will allow us to move forward. And I know Dan's gonna talk about the work that's going on with businesses. I wanted to make one more comment. We have a table, and Laura Van Way McGrory, who's with me today and leading this effort, we've formed, thanks to Climate Works and others, a global alliance on energy productivity to make sure that not just this goal of doubling energy productivity takes on worldwide, but that we actually have the implementation plans and the roadmaps to move it forward and achieve the goal. And I hope we can talk about that as we move on. Thanks, Kateri. And, uh, and Dan, since uh, Kateri gave you the, the lead-in already, uh, can you share with us what uh, Climate Works Foundation is doing? Sure. So I, I have the privilege today of uh, being half of Mark Kemba. I'm not sure which half. The, the other half is, is tight, <laughs> tight here. So um, uh, my, my telepathy skills are slightly failing me this morning, so I'll do my best to, to channel Mark and what, what, he, what he would have said. So we, we, Climate Works, are working with uh, the climate group on the issue of energy productivity in particular corporate leadership. For us, really, the starting point for the conversation was that policy is absolutely essential, but policy doesn't always enable um, the greatest ambition from, from the corporate sector. And yet, many businesses uh, want to do more, can do more, and, you know, and some are doing more. The, the, there's often a struggle, I think, with efficiency to um, well define what success looks like. Uh, it's a bit more amorphous than, than, than renewable energy, for example. Uh, and, and leadership often requires collaboration in order to identify what those 
um, what those targets are, um, what best practice looks like. So th this was the starting point for the conversation. I mean, our theory of change is really that if we can, if we can put these building blocks in place by having a target, by actually um, supporting a, a leadership club, by shining a spotlight on some of the best practices, we can actually encourage these businesses to go further and then also to feed that back into the, the policy development process because businesses that can become champions of change and they can support the policies that governments often think that the businesses don't want. So uh, that was where we started. I, I was then looking at what was happening on renewable energy and, and was really impressed with some of the commitments that are coming through from some of the world's most influential businesses that are making commitments to, to go 100% renewable. And then the likes of Apple and, and, and others uh, in the tech industry in the US actually now putting pressure on some of the utilities and saying to the utilities that um, they actually want more renewable energy in the mix um, for, uh, for the states where they're locating their, their offices and, and putting some pressure upwards there. And, and so I said to Mark, you know, great work on, on RE100, the We Mean Business Coalition has pulled together some excellent organizations, got some influential businesses that are signing up. Um, where are we on energy productivity? You know, Mark, you know, what's going on? Uh, and Mark said, hmm, yeah, let, let, let's have a chat about that. I said, you know, the benefits are huge. We've got precedent in the US from Kateri and RE100 and, and energy productivity, they go together. You know, by identifying the, uh, the marriage of those two, we can identify the lowest cost decarbonization pathway, essentially, saving businesses money and allowing them to, uh, to go further and to do the right thing by the climate. And so Mark, Mark was, yeah, absolutely, let, let's talk about this. So we've been working together over the last, last few months to try and develop a a corporate leadership platform on energy productivity that will be part of the We Mean Business Coalition. We're doing that in partnership with Kateri as part of the overall uh, Global Alliance on Energy Productivity with an aim of supporting the most influential businesses in the world to double their energy productivity. Our initial focus is on businesses in the US, in China, in Europe, and in India. Uh, we are also forging the links to, to businesses in, in Australia and others through the Global Alliance that Kateri just mentioned and looking to, to focus on a number of different sectors. And we're hoping to be able to offer the opportunity for like-minded corporate leaders on energy productivity to come together to collaborate, to have that peer-to-peer -peer exchange, to provide them with both market and, and public recognition for the leadership position that they take, and then to allow them to have ac access to the latest thinking on, on energy productivity. So we're in our consultation phase at the moment. Uh, please look out for some updates uh, in the coming weeks. You'll, you'll probably see things in some of the events that are fairly well known around the world. We're keen to hear from you as, as, we, as we shape this out. Uh, come and talk to either members of the We Mean Business Coalition, uh, Kateri, obviously, from the Global Alliance. Brian, is Brian in the room? Brian, put his hand up there. Brian used to run the uh, climate change program for, for Coca-Cola. Brian's helping us to, uh, to develop this. Uh, and you know, I really think this is a great opportunity for businesses to take a leadership position and to demonstrate um, how we can best use energy to deliver the outcomes that customers want and that society needs. Thank Thanks, you. Dan. Um, Mark, and you will share some examples of the work that, um, that C40 is doing around the world, around uh, cities and urbanization and transportation. Sure, and for, for C40 as a... A cities and climate change organisation, energy productivity is in, an increasing um, focus for us, partly just for the, the simple reason that if one's going to make any headway around energy productivity, it has to happen in cities. We've already heard this morning, half of the world lives in cities. I think George said 30,000 new urban dwellers just in the time it took him to get here from Bristol. It adds up to 1.4 million additional urban dwellers each week. But perhaps more, imp more importantly that, than that, bad urban development is one of the biggest drivers of rising greenhouse gas emissions and, and broader sustainability um, challenges. So that kind of now discredited 20th century model of suburban sprawl and mobility based on private car use still dominates new and uh, growing uh, development, despite many wonderful alternative examples around the world. And we have to change that. I think the second, the second thing that is, though, that we're, we are starting to, to win, that, win that argument because the benefits of uh, improving uh, energy productivity, going down a low-carbon urban development path, are now increasingly clear. And if I take an example of, of two of the C40 uh, member cities, it, it's very striking. You take Copenhagen, which is, is one of the, the sort of poster childs for, for a... Uh, a low carbon development pathway, a, a very uh, densely designed city as a, active, uh, a result of active public policy, 40% uh, of trips to work by bicycle, 
one of the lowest levels of car usage in the world and one of the lowest per capita carbon emissions of any uh, wealthy de developed um, city. That city spends 4% of its annual GDP on, on transport, on maintaining its transport system and improving it. At the other end of the spectrum, Houston, uh, an example of the North American urban sprawl model, a city that's entirely designed for the car, 14% of their GDP annually is consumed on maintaining their transport system. So a huge economic premium to Copenhagen for its, its low carbon uh, development pathway, which is, which is starting to win the argument, particularly in the global south where cities are developing rapidly, about which path they would, they would rather go down. But I think that the final reason we're particularly focused around energy productivity is the evidence that cities are really, city governments are really taking uh, a lead in, show, in showing the alternative path. And a, a couple of examples just, just to end, which are, are sort of rather different in, in, in approach. Sydney, which leads uh, our private building energy efficiency uh, network, has a target for a 30% reduction in um, energy consumption in its buildings. It has actually very little uh, regulatory power to achieve that and therefore as a, a program of engagement with the private sector uh, with homeowners uh, uh, largely based around incentives and the provision of information or of the economic uh, benefits of achieving improved energy efficiency but is, is motivating the program which has a, a climate change goal largely around the macroeconomic benefits a 200 million uh, Australian dollar uh, economic premium each year growth in in jobs and a reduction in energy costs for for homeowners and a slightly sort of coming from a slightly different governmental perspective Shenzhen in, in China which we're increasingly uh, working with a city that now has by far the largest electric bus fleet in the world 1300 buses already on its street it'll be 4000 within in the next few years whereas most of our, our cities, even the Londons and the New York, have only a, ha a handful of electric uh, buses, let alone uh, broader electric vehicles, has achieved that policy because of the, the political toxic toxicity of air pollution uh, in China, but has now created on the back of it a, a major export industry for its BYD, the company that's largely led that. And indeed, when Shenzhen joined the C40 network a year ago, uh, they completely changed the character of our electric vehicle programme. Cities that thought a, a successful pilot was nine or ten vehicles now see a new standard that they need to reach of a thousand or so. And we've published 20 cities have come together to have a, uh, a low carbon vehicle declaration, which is essentially a message to the market in each of their own regions. If you don't start supplying us with a low carbon and electric buses, we're going to be buying them from China, where they're already working very successfully. Okay, thanks Mark. And last but not least, Thais, uh, you guys work a lot with governments and NGOs and companies that, that use a lot of energy and producers. Um, your perspectives from the work that you guys do with, with your clients? Thanks, uh, thanks, John. When I was asked two hours ago to uh, be the second replacement for Mark, I thought uh, this is always the best preparation because I like to speak from the heart as you did, uh, uh, George, I must say. Um, I'm 35 years in industry. I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, I'm a business leader, between brackets, uh, but I want to do my utmost to make this a better planet. Why? I have four kids. I have one grandchild. I want to look them in the eyes, and I want to have their feedback that I have done what should be done. It's a first very personal plea. So business leaders need to take action. I'm pleased to work with a great firm called Ecofis. And we've done a lot of macro work for governments, etc. I don't want to focus on the macro uh, items. I want to give you an example of something on a micro level, which is extremely important. The purpose of this talk was very much the link energy efficiency, energy, energy production with economics. And I would always say economics from a sustainable viewpoint. Um, Look at the total life cycle costs. The short-term bucks won't make it. Look at the complete total life cycle cost when you look about uh, economic investments. Um, we have, um, Ecofis and myself have been involved with some interesting examples. We see in different parts of the world, when I look at individual households, I was thinking, what shall I say here? I can look at households, I can look at industries or small, medium enterprises, but let me focus at the combination of individual households at city level, village level, 
in combination with small medium enterprises. What we see at different parts of the world is a very interesting phenomenon. We see households taking the initiative to form energy corporations, energy collectives. Why do they do that? Maybe sometimes because they feel that governments are not pushing enough, because they feel like many of us here in the audience to show personal leadership. And what we see, and I like to place energy efficiency in any production in the right context. And the context is decentralized, sustainable power generation, together with energy efficiency, with storage, with electrical transportation, but always taking the consumer interest at heart centrally. And if you play this game smartly, you will see to run good business cases, storage, for instance, come in play. But then automatically, people have to become more efficient in the way they use their energy. I've been involved in a very interesting part of it in 2009. It was in the northern part of the Netherlands, where we created 27 households, smart homes with smart appliances. Now think of this. The large companies are developing freezers. They can be switched off for 48 hours or longer. There are different appliances coming, so less energy consumption. And that in combination with decentralized power generation, in combination with to meet the supply and demand curves, storage in quite often a number of countries, storage is not a viable business case, but looking at from a, if you combine a number of households or if you look at large commercial buildings, I know of cases in Germany that storage becomes far more and more interesting. If you look at that integrated energy value chain, energy efficiency is a winner. And you need to see it from that holistic integrated approach. That's the first comment I like to make. The second comment, if you allow me, the time is there. It's all about innovation. It's about new ways of working is connecting stakeholders in a different way together. I'm very pleased, George, the way you, as in your municipality, took that lead. And it is about individuals, people like myself, working with municipalities, working with a distribution network company, sort of thinking of smart solutions about how to deal with the peaks in a network. It is about, um, it's about knowledge institutes. And you come up with new ways of working. You come up with new business models, you come up with new social models. And I think this is also, I think, we ought to, uh, we ought to include, we ought to uh, focus on when we talk about this important subject, energy efficiency, energy production versus economics. We need to look at it from a more broader perspective. That will be my introduction statement. Uh, thanks, at this, uh, thanks at this um, I, I learned very early on in my career that if you want to change behavior, you need to, have, you need to walk the talk. Um, so uh, we're going to start with social media questions first, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, uh, first question that got actually the, the highest votes, um, and it's a general question. It's not addressed to anyone in, in specifically, but, but Kateri, for sure you um, uh, want to start with this one. Um, the question is, what are the benefits of focusing on energy productivity rather than energy efficiency? And you spoke about it a little bit. Well, first of all, let me say, yes, I did speak about it a little bit. So when you look at what we've accomplished in the U.S., for example, in energy productivity, I said we doubled it between um, 1980 and 2010. And the result of that, it, the studies that have been done say about 60% of that improvement was a direct result of energy efficiency policies and actions. It's some of the, the other 40% structural changes in the economy and such, but 60%, so more than half, direct result coming from energy efficiency. Um, the reason for looking at energy productivity as opposed to just simply looking at uh, a reducing demand is that you, it, it allows you to look at all the good things that come from deploying energy efficient be efficiency, becoming more energy product productive. So I, what I didn't tell you in the opening remarks was the study that we did that looked at what happens in the US if we do double energy productivity. Well, there's $327 billion of savings that go to the economy. To make that more meaningful, think about it in terms of families, it's about $2,000 a family a year savings on their energy costs. 
it reduces our need for imported energy to below 10%, to 7% of our needs. So it creates 1.3 million jobs. These are things that, that if you're only talking about energy efficiency, you're not able to get a handle on. And oh, by the way, and, and I think this is the biggest oh, by the way, but it isn't something that we stress because it's not so much a driver for action, at least in the US. We will reduce emissions of greenhouse gases in the US if we double energy productivity to one third below the, where they were all the way back in 2005. So enormous gains on that, all while we're focused on improving the economy, improving quality of life, doing things that just make economic good sense. Um, and, and you know, some in the environmental community may argue with me that, well, we need to do this for the good of the environment. I don't care why anyone takes the actions they take and we need them to, to act. And if, if it's the economic benefit, the bottom line benefit to a company, to a local government, to the national governments, to the world, that's fine and dandy by me. So it, this switch and frame to talking about the holistic, like Tice said, has really made a difference. It's opened people's eyes that we can actually have this impact and, and do good while doing well economically. Thanks. Dan, from, from your perspective? Yeah, just, a, just a quick additional comment mm -hmm. there. And part, so partly this is semantics, and we, one can argue about efficiency and productivity, but, but for me, it's really about the, the title of this conference, which is about transformation. And you know, when one typically thinks about efficiency, let's say at the, the manufacturing level, at the factory level, you'd often hone in on the efficiency of a pump or a motor. A critical components in industrial processes is that you use your ounce of energy, and if you can make them more efficient, then we'll, we'll save lots of energy. Uh, if you think about uh, uh, energy productivity, though, in the manufacturing process, it, cre it, it creates more, more of a systems thinking approach to what's going on. And, uh, and one would then look at the, the factory as a, as a whole unit and understand the energy flows and the total amount of energy that's going into the production of a particular product, not just um, uh, really trying to tweak the efficiency of something. And, uh, and another example would be, would be with, with transport, let's say. If, if you thought about efficiency, you'd immediately hone in on, OK, fuel efficiency. How, how more efficient can we, can we make these current cars? Whereas if you think about energy productivity, you'd say, OK, we need mobility. This is what customers really want. They want mobility. How much energy goes into providing the mobility that customers want? And then you start thinking about urban planning. You start thinking about transport. You start thinking about EVs and how they plug into houses. You start thinking about uh, driverless cars, etc. So, 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 so to me, it's very much about systems thinking and transformation that takes us from efficiency to productivity. Thanks. Uh, this is a good lead into into this next question, and, and I'll go to Tyson and come back here. Um, question is, what do you think are the best instruments for financing the required transformational shift in energy productivity? Can you see green bonds playing an important role? Famous debate. Every time um, when a new project is starting, how are we going to finance it? Um, let's talk from experience. Let's make it very practical for the audience, and then let's take it there at 30,000 feet. Subsidies is, is not always easy. It's not always easy to get financing. I would say that uh, I've seen, fortunately, now enough business cases where it is possible that there's still certain schemes, whether we call it in Dutch, Salderingsregeling, where you get a certain discount, you could qualify that as a certain subsidy, uh, that you will get a initial momentum to get certain things going. We've seen it in Germany, very clearly, on the solar side, where it's a tremendous push. But if I look now in the, in, in the Netherlands as an example, um, the cost price, for instance, if I look at, at the combination of, and I, again, I want to put it in this holistic, broader context, of, of decentralized generation and energy efficiency, uh, quite often you don't need subsidies. Um, sure, the schemes may not be very big, but you can start already making a business case um, um, uh, at a very small level. I think what, what there is a, a push needed on, on country levels is to make, to make the instruments more accessible to, to groups, uh, particularly when large pilots are being run in municipalities. Um, um, particularly if you want to link energy efficiency with this whole uh, supply-demand uh, uh, curves and, and, and where storage becomes an important aspect, then uh, financing, particularly in financing at this stage, becomes an important part. 
I think there needs to be a, a larger push on, on national governments to make the instruments more accessible. Mm -hmm. um, despite that, uh, Jan, what I see is very much still that pilots are started, that, that even um, groups of individuals or small companies are still taking the initiatives, etc. I mean, but just Where are you guys getting the financing for, well, for the I projects that you guys <coughs> run? Quickly take the two together and, and, yep. and, and come to that, because I think, I think there it, it's very helpful to focus on energy productivity rather than just energy, energy yep. efficiency for, for my constituency, city governments, because quite often the direct financial benefits of an energy efficiency programme don't accrue to the city government, right. and therefore it can be hard to motivate <laughs> the policy, whereas most governments have, have a general power to do anything that furthers the well-being of, of, of the city. And that broader, being able to make that broader holistic argument, which I think is now well proven, the new Climate Economy Commission has been particularly helpful, that a low carbon development path will deliver improved well-being faster than a high carbon path. Half of our, our members are now in the global south. Being able to say to them it's not a choice between development and tackling climate change, the route is the same, low carbon is extremely helpful. But of course that issue of finance re really, really does arise. And it, that I think there's often a, a misconception that, that city governments don't have the, the power to deliver major action around energy productivity or climate change. They, they absolutely do. And actually what we see with our members is the vast majority of the actions that, they, that are achieved in the cities are financed directly by the city government. Mm -hmm. That's okay at the moment while we're doing the low-hanging fruit, but it's a real break on ambition in the, in the longer term. And green bonds, yes, v v definitely very interested. But I think there's a, there's a wider issue. We, there's the, the talk of the $100 billion uh, gr green climate fund. Not a single dollar of that will be directly accessible to city governments, a major constituency for delivering that city action. It all goes through the national constituents. One of the things we're arguing for at the moment is the creation of a, a city climate fund that cities can mm -hmm. directly bid in so at least they get the seed funding to develop the projects, which then we hope the majority of finance will come from the private sector and come behind. And that's a global fund? The, pr the proposal is to create a global city okay. fund, okay. yes. Ties that trigger another? Yeah, uh, a quick, quick comment. Uh, <coughs> sometimes, you know, when you have a long working day and sometimes you become a bit cynical about uh, all the innovation funds which are available or not available, but fortunately they're becoming more available. What is a very good route, what's well, a very good road to success, that when I talk about new business models where stakeholders work together in sort of on a, on a, on a, on a city level, is for instance with the large manufacturers. I have been involved with pilots, the company has been involved with pilots where, um, and I won't call the names here, but large manufacturers are coming up with new devices, more energy efficiency. They are prepared to invest in that, be part of that pilot. Why? Very simple. They see the business model, they see the business case, they see that they need to change to come up with more energy efficiency appliances, etc. So it's also sometimes uh, an in-kind sort of uh, contribution where you make good partnerships yeah. Yeah, to make that next step forward. And I really would like uh, to stress that point here that we, we don't all, all, always focus on that. But there is a heck of a lot to, to gain from industry, work with them and let them invest because they will see that they have to change uh, with certain type of appliances as an example. Yeah, I just want to make a, a couple of quick comments on this because finance and all the studies that we've done and we're working mm -hmm. on an implementation roadmap with the Department of Energy that we're going to roll out next week. It's a huge issue and one that is being tackled in a lot of different ways. And I think uh, the couple that I want to raise are one with respect to cities. In the U.S. we have something called PACE, which is Property Assessed Clean Energy Bonds. And cities can actually float mm -hmm. municipal bonds that provide funding um, for both commercial and in some instances residential energy efficiency upgrades. And it has proven to be something that's very attractive and, and getting, I think, a lot of traction. Um, and hopefully more now that the, uh, that the administration has directed our national um, funding sources, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, to take some action in that regard. The second thing is tax policy. Um, again, in the U.S. when we had, which are now lapsed, energy efficiency uh, tax policies for businesses and homeowners, that helped to free up financing because people, if they could get a tax credit, could get a tax deduction, were more willing to make the investment. And the, the last thing I wanted to say on green bonds is that, yes, there is a growing market there, 
Um, but we are concerned as efficiency advocates that that bond market in energy projects, at least, will go towards things that are intuitively green, windmills, solar panels, and yet the biggest carbon impact can come from investments in efficiency. Uh, there is no standard now for determining how green a bond is, no independent standard, and, and most of these bonds are self-certifying or just naming themselves green bonds, and there's work in that area, but the Alliance has actually developed something we call carbon count, but a metric that you can apply to green bonds to let you see what the carbon impact is per thousand dollars of investment, because we want to drive that market to energy efficiency, not away from necessarily renewable, but make sure we get our fair share. Dan, briefly. Yeah, very quickly. So I think a really exciting new development in terms of financing efficiency was uh, in the US earlier on this year. It was the first securitization mm -hmm. of uh, energy efficiency retrofits at the residential level. And, and, that, and that's been really tough. It took, it took about six years to work this out. Uh, there, there was a lot of effort that went into trying to standardize the investments. Um, really trying to make an energy efficiency investment look like any other investment to bundle it up because of course the challenge with efficiency is often the, these are these are small uh, value investments that uh, a lot of the financial community are not interested in but if you can actually aggregate them together in, in a way that investors can understand um, that then more money can flow and so the first first of those happened uh, around April this year and, and, and efforts are being made to roll that out to other states in the US and I don't think securitization is something that only works in the US I think it's transferable to, mm -hmm. to Europe probably China and various other economies around the world. So, so more instruments uh, on the financing side coming available. Um, I actually had a meeting with Deutsche Bank as an example, Kateri, uh, in New York the other, the other week. Um, and the Deutsche Bank now has created a $325 million fund themselves to, to, to finance energy efficiency uh, uh, projects in, uh, in North America. So you see some of the, even the private firms, investment uh, banks, uh, beyond you know, the World Bank and the, and the, the development banks, uh, uh, investing in this in this space because they see a return, right. to be honest. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience. Go ahead. If you can state your name and is there, a mic or I just uh, there is a mic. It's coming right there. Go ahead. Hi, I'm, uh, is this on? Can you hear me? There is a light, I think. Yeah, it's on. Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Megan Darby. I'm a journalist with RTCC, a uh, climate change news site. I wanted to ask about carbon pricing. Uh, I haven't heard it mentioned yet. And because um, uh, whether you're framing it as energy efficiency or energy productivity, we're talking about relative improvements. And for the climate, we need uh, absolute cuts in, in emissions. Um, so, you know, how do you make sure that uh, improvement in efficiency uh, and productivity uh, translates to that benefit? And um, what role do you see for carbon pricing in that? Who wants to start carbon pricing? Kateri, you want to? Uh, well, take I will say from the Alliance to Save price. Energy. Yeah, we, you know, prices matter, and uh, we believe that there should be a price on carbon. Um, we're indifferent as an organization as to whether that's done through a cap and trade program or through a tax, but there should be a price on carbon. Having said that, that may not be achievable at a national level. It's certainly at the U.S. We see it working very well in REGI, in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, and in what's going on in the West. And I, I believe we'll come to that day. Personally, I believe that. But um, hopefully that's somewhat of an answer for you. Go ahead. Well, yeah, I'm going to take the second part of the question first. Uh, c clearly, energy improved energy productivity absolutely has to lead to absolute reductions mm -hmm. in fossil fuel energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. In the, the city context that I work, work in, the, the critical thing that we find there is, is actually, you know, it's unfashionable to say it, but some planning. You know, cities that have developed a comprehensive climate action plan for how they're going to reduce their emissions in their city in our network deliver three times as much action as the ones that don't have it and say we're not going to waste time with planning, we're just going to get on and do things. So having that comprehensive overall plan so you can see where the redu reductions are going to come from and how things add together is very important. Pricing for many, many of our member cities has a role to play and I think it's interesting actually that city governments have been taking a lead around carbon pricing. You would expect it to be a federal government uh, or state-led um, initiative, particularly Tokyo with its very successful cap and trade scheme for improving energy efficiency in buildings which set a, a, a four-year target of an 8% reduction 
in, in private building energy efficiency, and it's now, I think, above 20%, 23%, I think. At, interestingly, with very little trading, actually. It may be a cultural phenomenon, but most of the companies just wanted to be seen to have achieved the, the, the target. Um, so the cap worked rather than the trade. But that idea has now spread. There are, I think, seven of the major Chinese cities that have introduced similar kinds of city-based cap and trade, first for buildings, but Shenzhen is about to include transportation in its cap and trade scheme, which I think will be very interesting to watch. Thank you. Uh, another question? Yeah, sorry, I sorry. Yeah, I'll just come in on that. I mean, carbon pricing, great if we can get it. I see it as complementary to an energy productivity target in, in that it would drive the most economically efficient responses to achieve uh, carbon reduction. So I, I think they're, they're um, mutually compatible. In terms of the need for an absolute reduction, uh, yes, in the context of uh, the work we're doing with the climate group on, on a cor corporate leadership platform on energy productivity. We've purposely gone for productivity rather than, say, an absolute energy reduction because it's just a very difficult conversation to have with a business to say, you know, particularly if they're growing. If it was a business in India, you know, and, you know the economy's, you know, pr progressing much faster than it is in most other parts of the world. And then to say, so, so now, now have an absolute reduction in energy use, it, it, it's really quite hard. So the, the trick is to make sure that you have a, a sufficiently ambitious energy productivity target and that you're aligning the efficiency with renewables. That's where I say that the, the, any, any uh, ambitions on renewable energy 100 must go together with an energy productivity target so you mm -hmm. find the pathway to lowest cost decarbonisation. Okay. For the lady who asked the question, also in view of the time, uh, we uh, did for the World Bank an interesting study on, uh, on, uh, on carbon pricing. So I would say perhaps in the break, see me or Steffi and uh, give you some interesting information on that. Yeah. We have another question in the back. Yeah, my name is Sophie Poonten from Smart Freight Center. Um, I'm a global non-profit organization on freight and logistics. We see the UN uniting governments, and I really welcome We Mean Business, essentially uniting some of the leading business networks on sustainability. What my concern is is that there's so many initiatives, NGOs, platforms popping out of the ground that we, we risk death by initiatives. <laughs> and I would just like your view um, or your recommendations. Is something like a We Mean NGOs or We Mean Civil uh, possible for NGOs, do you think that would be a, a good idea so that the, 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 the NGOs that all mean well also start aligning better to both support business and to support the government in achieving climate goals? Thanks. Well, this one is for you, Kateri, and, and then. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's no Dan question and I about are that. On this <laughs> yeah, um, I, I think that that is, it, it, it's a very, very important question yeah. to be addressed because there are so many different frames and different initiatives. And the way that we're trying to uh, to tackle that issue at the Alliance to Save Energy is to align ourselves and make sure we're working together with other initiatives. So we have conversations going with the C40 folks, with the Sustainable Energy for All. We are working in partnership, and I think we actually have an executed MOU with the Climate Working Group for this. And um, we're really trying to bring together, so our Global Alliance for Energy Productivity, and again, come see us at the booth and we'll give you more information, has a steering committee that is the leaders from various of these efforts that are going on. I'm looking at Benoit Lebeau because I would also say that it's not just an NGO initiative du jour kind of issue or problem that we have. It's also one with governments. And you look at even within the U.S. federal government, there are 20 different initiatives around energy efficiency that need to come together. You go into the clean energy ministerials, the G20. It, there's, there's a lot that we need to try to comprehend together. Um, so working together is very, very important, not getting across purposes. Uh, but I, I, that's, that's how we'll make sure that we're all working together. I'm not so troubled by a lot of different names. If we're pulling in the same direction and working together and making sure that we're aligning, I think it's going to be okay. So that's... I want, I want to take a, a, we talk a lot about policies and initiatives. Let, let's take quickly two other angles. Uh, I, I, th I think this one is really interesting. I, I spoke about customer choice. I think, I think Thijs spoke about what customers want as well. Uh, will consumers actively select products with greener credentials or are we just kidding ourselves? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Thijs, you want to? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I'm sitting here for the last sort of 45 minutes and, and the key question which, which puzzles me is how did you get go the hearts and minds of the average citizen? You need to influence governments. <clears throat> you need to influence provinces and municipalities. But at the end of the day, it's about the average citizen. You need to reach here. 
And how do you do that? And interesting question, by the way, on all the NGOs. We work a lot with them. I think it's also for them, it's very important that there is one message. And I believe that's a, that's a key aspect. Maybe one of the colleagues can respond to that. But, but, but coming back to whether they are prepared to invest or not. I think it, it, it's, let's take it at 30,000 feet first. It's first of all making clear what the benefits are. Do we, in a country, have a very clear message to, to our population about really what is necessary, and what the influences, what the impacts are of what, of, of what we're doing? Is the message clear to the average citizen? I wonder. I put a big question mark. I asked the question around, do you? And I think it starts with that, is, is that sense of urgency? Is do everybody feel that sense of urgency? And if that is the case, then come, then start to explain, come with good examples so that people become motivated. I mentioned the energy corporations, energy collectors, and what we see in different parts, particularly in the Netherlands, but also in Germany, is that people take that initiative because they are convinced that something needs doing. So it has to do with also a very consistent message in the country level. Hey, folks, here's where we stand. This is what is necessary. And do, and do, the, and the, and do the folks believe if the government brings out a message? So there's a lot to be done in that area before you can reach hearts and minds. But th that, that's what it's all about. And I'm positive. I'm an opp opportunistic uh, person. I think we, we're able to reach it, but it takes time. And I think we have to play the game smarter in that sense. Uh, we have to change our communication uh, messages uh, in that sense as well. So there's, there's quite a bit of work to be done there. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it is, pos is possible, but you've got to, got to pick the right, the right message. And to, to any, take an example of, of where clearly citizens have become sort of proud of the, action, the individual action that they're taking that has an environmental benefit. In, in, in the city of Houston, which I kind of maligned earlier, but actually is, is one of <laughs> our more active... Uh, member cities in Seafort and a, and a, a very, uh, very climate-focused mayor there. They're currently considering moving away from household waste separation for recycling because they've calculated they'll actually be more efficient just to get it all in one bin and mechanically separate it um, at, at a, a number of central depots. One of the problems they're coming up against in trying to change that policy is that the citizens are rebelling against it because they rather like the fact that they feel good about the fact that they separate their waste and they feel they've made a contribution. Having initially, no doubt, when it was introduced years ago, there'd been a lot of resistance to that. So I think people kind of can get to a point where they, where they, they, they feel good about it. But you've got to pick the right thing. And let's take a different example. I, I was very much in, involved in bringing in the congestion charge in London when I, when I worked for the, the former mayor of London, Ken Livingstone. That was a policy that was un completely unpopular in every opinion poll we did in the run-up to bringing in the policy. Only, only a f handful of politicians would have been brave enough um, to do it. But ultimately, it was possible to bring it in because it was motivated very strongly with the support of many big businesses on around the economic argument of tackling congestion and making Lon a London a better place to do business. But the primary motivation for the mayor was absolutely always an environmental one. And it was very interesting when, when we did the polling after it had been introduced and support for the scheme went from about 30% of Londoners to about 60% of Londoners that one of the things that people who had switched from car to bus said is they felt good about themselves, that they were now making a contribution to London being a better place. Okay. Can I, uh, two seconds? No? Sure. Okay. Just want to say, two on, on consumer behaviour, appealing to hearts and minds is important. Energy Star is a label that people can easily see in the US. You have yeah. something similar, I think, in Europe. 87% recognition. Save 30, saving $34 billion a year. So empowering people with information, but getting the junk out of the marketplace is even more important. So giving people better choices. Appliance and equipment standards in the US just since 2008 are saving $380 billion a year. So get rid of the stuff and people, you know, their options are only efficient. Yeah, we have, uh, we have 80 people working with NAP, with, uh, with DOE on that program in the That's US. That's great. Um, I want to wrap up. Uh, we are, we're going for a break, uh, coffee break. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank the panelists. Um, unfortunately, we could not answer all the questions. There were more questions coming in, but we'll all be around here uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, I hope you all found this interesting uh, initial panel discussion, broad overview of, uh, of energy productivity, what it is and, and, and why it is important to measure it in a way where uh, there's probably more shareholders uh, interested 
in driving this not only forward, but making step changes. Step change is needed. Um, I, I am very hopeful. Um, again, I, I, see, I see worlds coming together. I see stakeholders coming together uh, around objectives that are more aligned than ever uh, uh, that I've seen in the past. So with that, I want to wrap it up and hand it back over to you. Please thank Jan and all the panelists. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you.